Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the second day of Lucene Revolution. It is my pleasure to present John Gifford from Logley, and enjoy. Thank you. This is on. Okay. okay. So I'm John from Logley. Um, we were founded about a year ago um, by Cord, who's here, Rafi, who's back in San Francisco, Hoover who's our beaver, and me. And we've since hired a few people and uh, are rolling out, rolling closer to full-blown production. Um, we are currently in, in a private beta. Um, we have about 20 customers using the system at the moment. And what we do is logging as a service. We had to come up with something. So um, basically, you send us your logs, we archive them and make them searchable for you, and eventually we'll make them analyzable and we'll give you a whole bunch of other tools to let you play with your logs and extract information out of them. Um, so in order to do that, we focus primarily on search. I'm a search guy, I've been doing search for a long time. Um, this floor is really creaky. Um, so we focused on taking solar and making it as, as close to real time as we could without actually using uh, NRT. We, uh, it says here, high volume, high input rate. We are intending at some point to be able to deal with hundreds of thousands of log events per second. So the entire system is architected to deal with that. Um, we're not at that level, um, except occasionally in testing when we break things. But, um, you know, the the system has been designed for scale horizontally. So um, as we increase load, we just scale, and it should just work. Uh, and we're near real time. We're not actually real time. We're not using the NRT um, component of solar because a year ago, um, we made a decision to go with solar cloud, and NRT didn't play nicely with solar cloud, and solar cloud was more valuable to us than NRT. Um, so I'm really looking forward to the next speech, actually. So logging logs as a search problem are kind of different than a lot of other problems. So for a start, there's just a very large number of documents. I mean, it's kind of like Twitter. There's a lot of documents, and they're all fairly small, So, um, which means, which is good because it means the overhead of getting an event into the system is pretty low because there's not a lot of stuff to parse. Um, there's a very, very small amount of data that comes with every event that is very useful. Um, and I'm talking specifically about syslog data here. So we get a timestamp, we get the originating machine, and we get the log type um, and, and the severity. Um, so really, when you look at our documents, it's very simple. It's text for the event and then these three bits of metadata. Um, so our document structure is very simple, which is nice. There aren't duplicates, right? When you are indexing an event stream, there's no such thing as a duplicate. If you see the same error, it might look like a duplicate, but it's not. It's a different event. So we don't have to deal with updates ever, which is also nice. Um, so we focus just on inserting the stuff into the index as fast as we possibly can. The other really nice thing about logs, and really important one, is the bottom one. Time sequence is relevance, right? So yes, we're doing full text search. Yes, you can do full-blown Lucene queries. You can construct arbitrarily complex queries. But really, the primary relevance is time. So that makes a whole bunch of things a lot easier um, than they could be. Um, so we get a very simple kind of index structure. And we get, because of the time sequence stuff, we get completely natural sharding based on time. So what that means is we can shard purely based on time. And it becomes very easy to manage. Well, it becomes theoretically very easy to manage shards, because you just build a shard for a particular time period and then move on to the next time period. And then you can manage those individual shards however you need. So search is also different. So 
<clears throat> if you think about what people do with logs, they don't search them all day, right? We don't have customers, and we don't have a lot of customers, and the customers aren't sitting there searching all day, right? They come in when there's a problem, and they do a search, and they are normally really interested in what happened in the last hour, right? Or the, you know, maybe they know that something broke at between 3 and 4 o'clock in the morning, and they want to look at that. But it's very focused search, and it's very kind of high intensity but short duration. So we have, the system is primarily geared around indexing. Like that's our focus as far as performance goes. Search kind of comes out of that naturally. Like search performance is great, but it hasn't actually been an issue for us or a focus because it doesn't need to be because of the way that people search logs. Um, and you can see here, if these are, if these are time shards, imagine that you know, that's five minutes and that's five minutes. You can see that you can build very large indexes, but that there's a definite hotspot where people are actually looking for stuff in the index. So um, we get a really simple, easy to manage, sharded system with a very light search load on a very restricted amount of data. So we can support lots of customers and um, lots of data with, with actually fairly low machine resources. So how do we do it? We're using syslog as our primary input. We've all, we also have HTTP, so you can just send us individual events. But for high volume logging, that's not so great. So syslog, everyone knows syslog. 0MQ. Um, which, who know, who's heard of or used 0MQ? OK. So um, it's just a very, very high performance queuing system. And Solar Cloud. Now, the Solar Cloud that we're using is a year old. Um, it was on a branch, and it was the highest priority. And then the Solar Leucine merge happened. So it's now back to being almost committed back to trunk. Um, I was talking to Mark yesterday, so hopefully it's we'll be able to actually upgrade the trunk soon. Um, so using these three things, we get to or, or our users get all of their logs in one place and they can search them. Um, we have syslog stamping each event. We have the the um, architecture actually has a couple of layers between syslog and Solar, but it's really just routing and zero MQ stuff and distribution. So um, we get an event, it goes into a zero MQ queue, which goes to what we call a splitter, which then just fires it off to the appropriate solar indexer. Um, and we have a custom solar plugin that knows how to read zero MQ and inject it in the index. So we get really real time indexing into solar. Um, which is nice. And we're on the cloud, so um, we can very easily spin up boxes. So um, for search, this is kind of nice. Um, but for some of the other stuff we're doing down the track with Hadoop, this is, this is like a key part of it, because we can just spin up a whole bunch of boxes and then shut them down. So, but for now, anyway, what it means is that, yes? When am I committing? So we commit about every 10 seconds. And the shards that, we, the shards that we're writing to are very small. They're five minutes. So, and that's all configurable. We can, we can commit more often to smaller shards or commit less often to bigger shards. So this is kind of the architecture. Um, and I've kind of already explained everything. So here's your customer machines writing via syslog to our proxy boxes, load balanced, whatever. Um, the proxies um, just write to 0MQ. Um, there's actually another box in here that, there should be another box in here that is the splitter, which routes from here to the indexes, right? So, and these guys just sit there reading out of 0MQ as fast as they can, shoving it in the appropriate index, and then 
moving on to the next index each time the time boundary expires, right? Then all of that is kept, we keep track of all of that in Zookeeper. So this is part of Solar Cloud. Is the Zookeeper component knows where every single shard on the system is um, in terms of boxes. At a certain point, we just push the shards off onto other boxes. So the index of boxes we have in production right now are literally just building five minute shards. And the moment they finish building those, they just push them off to a cold box. And we have multiple layers of cold boxes. And those guys are the ones that deal with um, all of the merging. So we don't end up with an entire index of five minute shards. We crunch them, or we, sorry, we crunch them down into 30 minute shards and then four hour shards and then dailies and weeklies. Um, and then the rest of it is just regular <coughs> web app. So we have an API. You can hit search through the API if you want to. Um, our front end is built on top of our API. So, you know, hopefully it works. So why did we choose Solar Cloud? The main reason was um, it gave us facets and uh, migration. So, um, well, migration is not specifically part of Solar Cloud, but Solar, sorry, Solar gave us facets and migration. At previous jobs, I've written facets and migration um, and bolted them onto Lucene. So it's nice to just have Solar do it. And it also takes care of caching, which in our case, is pretty important um, for performance. Zookeeper, which is the main component of Solar Cloud, knows about every node and every shard on every node. So um, what that means is we can hit any solar node at all with a request, and it will figure out what other solar nodes it needs to hit to service the request. Right? Um, it also means that when we migrate a shard from a hot index SA to a cold box, every other box knows that immediately. So you get a request. If you're in the middle of a migration, the shard is still available on the box you're migrating off. So you get a request. It gets serviced by that node. Next request comes in. You've migrated. You hit the new node. So, And the other thing that we have going for us is <clears throat> Time-based shards mean it's really easy to limit the search load. Because if you come in and say, I want to search the last hour, then we know that that's a very restricted set of shards. And Zookeeper, because we know where every shard is, it's easy to enumerate the shards to hit to do the search. Right? So bear in mind that this is a very restricted case of search. Right? It's probably not applicable to a lot of problems. But for us, it works brilliantly. Um, and yeah, so uh, Mark's here. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Yannick. Um, they were incredibly helpful in getting us onto Solar Cloud a year ago. So, so I've already mentioned time-based sharding. So what we do is we just build these shards year, date, month, hour, minute, to year, date, month, hour, minute, right? Um, and we have completely taken over merging from Lucene. There's no automatic merging at all in our system, so which might seem a little strange to people. But the reason we do that is that the worst thing that can happen if you're trying to deliver real-time search is unpredictability in, in latency, in the search latency. So by taking over merging, we avoid that. We know exactly when that's going to happen. Um, and and we can also control exactly where it happens, which is equally important. I've already mentioned that hot shards are small. They're updated all the time. And there's no merging at all in those guys. So um, if we have a five, what are they, five minute um, index, and we're updating every 10 seconds, then there's going to be 60 segments in that shard, which sounds like a lot, but it's actually not that bad at all. And then to take. To build the cold shards, like I said, we just push the hot ones off. We do the merge, and then we have a new shard, which has a longer time range. And we just basically ripple up a, a series of levels of increasingly longer shards and push stuff around to the appropriate boxes to do that merging. So this 
That looks okay. Okay, so if I'm a shard, this is what happens to me. I get created, I get stuff shoved into me, and then I stop being updated because my time is up, right? And remember that we're basing all of this on the timestamp of when we receive the event from syslog. So it's strictly increasing, which is nice. So I'm, I just got created. And then the next guy gets created, but there's nothing to do yet because this guy's still being created. Next step is, sorry, I'm going the wrong way. Um, next step is the third guy gets created and lo and behold, the first two guys can be merged, right? because they're not being updated. So we do that. These are all level zero. That's a level one shard. And then we get to here. We're indexing this guy. And actually, what this has changed since I did this slide. But actually, what can happen is these guys can now merge. And we just keep doing that um, on whatever box we've decided we want to do that. So it's a very simple. In theory, it's a very simple, um, it's a simple sort of shard management technique. So every single node in our system can decide what to do with any shard on any other node, including itself, right? So which sounds a little scary, um, but actually is one of the reasons that the system is so robust. So if I'm uh, an indexing shard, uh, sorry, an indexing node, and I build a series of shards, I can decide whether I want to merge them or I want to pass them off to someone else to merge, right? Um, and when I pass them off, um, we 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 have a, a bunch of different ways that we pass them off. The, the the most usual one is that on creation, we just on creation of the next shard, we just push. But we can also do it um, at other times. We have played with a bunch of different things, but we eventually just uh, came down to let's just keep it simple and just do his creation, right? Um, we choose the new owner using Zookeeper data. So Zookeeper knows what nodes can do what in terms of or can handle what kind of shards. Um, so we just use that data to decide where to push it if we decide to push it. Um, we're using the replication handler. So if you look at our solar, our configs, everyone, everyone is a master. Um, there's, no, there's no real slaves in our system. Um, and we don't, at the moment, we don't actually do replication, replication. There's one copy of the index floating around, right? Um, and by using the replication handler, we get this nice kind of seamless migration. So while you're in the process of migrating, you can still search. And once it's over there, you can just shut this guy down. So there's no sort of, there's no confusion about who you should hit to get search results. Um, I should also say that every single customer has their own uh, index, right? So we have about somewhere between 20 and 40 customers like using the system, every single one of those guys has their own collection of shards. So 0MQ, why did we choose 0MQ? I did a very brief evaluation of a lot of queuing systems. And 0MQ was by far the fastest, by an order of magnitude faster than anything else. So, um, And since we're building for high um, input rates, that was the most important thing. So there are some things that 0MQ doesn't do that other things do, um, like durability. But the, the really important thing is you can pump massive amounts of data through. Like you can get a million events a second through a single commodity node in 0MQ, which is um, pretty amazing. So the other thing it gives us is just, I mean, it just gives us queuing so we can um, we can queue from any node to any other node. At the moment, the only things we queue from are the proxies to solar, right? And there's a queue internal to uh, the proxy, but at, at this stage, the most important 
zero MQ uses from the proxies to the solar node. And if you can imagine that um, we have, say, 10 proxies, and you're writing to all 10 of them. You're a customer, and you're writing to all 10 of them. We need to get, and, and you're writing to what is effectively the same index. So all 10 of those boxes need to be able to pump their data to a single solar instance to build that index. And ZeroMQ makes that easy. Um, yes? Um, yeah, it's designed for speed. And it is really fast. We'll find out. <laughs> I mean, the th the the thing is, there is it has uh, it has kind of some reliability features in it. So if a solar indexer goes down, for example, the queue that is that the queues that we're writing to it will just back up. They'll just persist to disk until a reader shows up again, until that solar box shows up again. So we haven't, as far as I know, um, other than when we pushed a retarded config and fired up two solar box, two solar instances on the same node. We haven't actually lost any data through zero MQ. And because it's so fast, there's and because solar can keep up with the with the event stream that we have right now, you know, it's in transit for like microseconds. So um, we haven't we haven't had any data loss problems directly caused to due to zero MQ. We've had them due to misusing zero MQ, but not for zero MQ itself. Um, so we have a plugin that just knows how to read a zero MQ queue and shove it into an index. Um, and it's fast. I keep saying that. It's really fast. It's really good. I highly recommend it. <clears throat> and this is how it works. So this is our plugin. It's not really, but it's roughly our plugin. So we have a map from some ID that you put in the message to some core, which is actually the customer index, right? And we can actually shard the customer indexes as well. So if you start sending us too much data, we'll just split your index into multiple sort of sub collections for the customer. But basically, um, this is solar. This is zero MQ. We just Open a con we create a context, we open a socket, and we connect to it, right? And so we're reading from some host.logly.com, right? And then we just read and shove it in the index, and that's it, right? The, the actual, our actual plugin is more complicated because we have to kind of demultiplex the events because they all come in on one queue um, and get, then get distributed out to the particular customer's index. But that's basically it. I mean, it's, it's very straightforward. So does it work? Um, yeah. So like I said, we have some customers. Um, we have had some problems. Um, but it's generally been really good. We use the system. The way we, when we spin up a new cluster or a test environment, um, the easiest way to test it is actually the fact that it's configured to write to itself, right? So we log our solar logs and our splitter logs and our client logs into the proxy, and then they come through. So the moment you spin up a, a cluster, it starts working on our data, on its own, it, actually its own data, right? Um, and Every now and then we screw up. So we pushed, um, to dev, we pushed something which logged, what was it? Oh, if it couldn't write an event to S3, it logged the event, right? So S3 was unavailable for 10 minutes, and we generated 3 million events because that was how many events were going through the system at the time, right? And actually, no, that's not true. So one event came through the system. It got logged because we couldn't write it to S3. So it went back in saying, I can't log. Came through, still couldn't log, and it just sat there going around and around and around, right? You know, shit happens. But anyway, the nice thing was 
<laughs> the nice thing was we generated a lot of load and the system just cruised through it. Yep. So yes and no. Um, we don't log at an event level anymore. <laughs> um, and you know there are <laughs> there are places there are places inside solar where it logs at an event level and we've had to turn those down and there was a lot of um, I I actually like logging a lot of data out of my app so I can tell what happened and doing this is a good way of kind of reining me in because otherwise I would log every event but now I can't so I have to actually summarize and whatever but anyway so the system itself just cruised right through it it's like three million events pfft, nothing we launched last Friday we launched an expanded private beta which was just a new rev of the system <clears throat> and what happened was and it was a new completely new cluster config that we never tried before and what happened was that the first downstream node from the indexer blew up right we misconfigured it we forgot to set you limit dash n right so we ran out of file handles so it stopped being able to do anything it couldn't accept any more indexes it was down right and it was down for, I don't know, six hours before anything bad happened. Because the indexer just kept indexing, right? Kept spitting out five minute shards, kept trying to push them, couldn't push them, so it just left them, right? Kept doing that. 2,000 cores later, each one of these is a core, each shard is a core. 2,000 cores later, it finally died, right? And this is a four core, eight gigabyte box. So we actually were planning on doing some performance testing to see how many cores we could get on a box and still have decent performance. So we know that it's something less than 2,000, right? So, um, and it's designed for failure because it will happen. And actually, that's an important point. What happened when we, so when it finally died on Sunday, um, we jumped in. We went, oh shit, you limit, fixed that, brought up that box, restarted the indexer, which had been down for a couple hours because no one noticed. Um, restarted the indexer, and everything almost magically just worked. Like every, all, the, all the five minute shards, the 2,000 of them, got migrated off to the box that was now up and available, right? And got merged and whatever. And we ended up within couple hours, we ended up back to where we would have been if nothing had happened at all, minus the two hours where we didn't notice that the indexer was down, right? So, you know, um, and it was designed to do that. Like, if a box goes down, it's not a big deal. You just bring it back up, and the thing will heal itself, which is nice. And like I said, we're adding a customer or two a day. If you want to be one, just come chat to us um, if I haven't put you off. Um, and we're at about 20, somewhere around 20 or 30. Um, well, we're at about 30 and about 20 are like, using it actively a lot. So, so what's next? Um, I want to get on trunk. Um, and hopefully I'll be able to do that soon. Um, we need a distributed data store, but actually after Grant's talk yesterday, I need to rethink that one maybe. Um, <clears throat> we are definitely moving to Hadoop um, because there's a lot of stuff you can do with a real-time index, but not everything, right? If you want to go do a whole bunch of complicated field extractions and do um, data mining out of your access logs and stuff like that, solar is just not going to cut it. So we need to be able to spin up big analysis jobs, and um, the easiest way to do that is just Hadoop it, right? Hadoop it, right? Um, and, and we'll have other ways in. 